what I have is alluded to in terms of model testing. First, I have a water tunnel of which I have performed an experiment, and the data is given in the chart of a couple of points on a graphical form. This model happens to be four inch diameter, so it's not very big, <laughs> kind of like a baseball or softball. One in water at different speed. I have different drag. And the axis pound here refers to pound what? Force. Pound force, thank you. Yeah, this is something I hope I'll repeat many times. Now having done this experiment, I'm going to try to extrapolate from this data <coughs> to an air balloon. It's almost similar to the dream example we just did. The balloon is eight foot in diameter, relatively much bigger than that of the model. And at a condition of the balloon moving at three feet per second, I want to know I want to know what is the drag force. step. What's the first analysis you have to do before you <coughs> submit it to? <coughs> when was number? That's uh, the kind of the final result, yes? What, what, what is it? Uh, dimensional, dimensional, that's exactly what I want to hear. Dimensional analysis. Yeah, you need to find the pi term first before you tell me I have to match the random stone. But the more important concept is I have to dimensionally analyze the problem. First starting with de deciding from your intuition what are the variables that would dictate this problem, which we know because you have seen it once, the same as the airport. Right. And then the dimensional analysis is trivial because we have done it already. And how many pi terms? Two. Two. And then you go from there. There are more than one way to solve this problem. I leave it up to your discretion to do it. You can use the graphical form, or you can do it another way, by interpretation. But the concept is the same. Dimensional analysis and matching all the pi terms. Yes? <laughs> Usually, this only at this stage, at this at an entry level fluid, the only term that you will neglect sometimes is the viscosity. Okay, so if the problem didn't mention viscosity, like the water pump, then don't put it in because you are making the problem more complex. And that's why I bring it to the point: if you don't see the viscosity, what did we assume? We, we assume implicit. Usually, that's what you have to be concerned with. Compressibility, by and large, we neglect that in this introductory class. You can, for, for, for all intent and purpose, assume density to be constant. Other than that, there's no more assumption you have to make. Right? Am I correct? Anything else that you want to clarify? Steady and steady, again, 99% of our problem is steady. But in real life, all those assumptions are not necessarily true. Yes? If density wasn't constant, would that just mean you'd have another pi term? Yes, absolutely. So what's the difference between the analysis of either a bicycle running on the street or automobile running at 60 miles per hour versus that of a missile flying in air? What is the difference between an F-15 going supersonic versus you jogging at 10 miles per hour? Have you heard of things called Mach number? That's what that is for. So the Mach number account for changing density. Most of our problem in this class, all the problem, we assume very small Mach number, less than 0.2. Anything that is flying through air, going at high speed, the Mach number exceeding 0.5 density cannot be assumed constant. And a very high Mach mark number, like Mach 20, space shuttle landing through the atmosphere. Density is first order. 
changes all the physics, right? So we are very, very simple minded as a first level fluid class, right? There are a lot more that we can learn by way of upper level classes or graduate school. Any other question on this homework? I think I, I set you up. This should be pretty straightforward. This is an interesting problem because it involves cavitation. So I want to take a step back, just look at the physics, right? So I told you you can make water boil by reducing the pressure. So if you are a submariner, meaning you, officer, you're, you're a serviceman working in a submarine, if your propeller spins very fast, and propeller is kind of like an airfoil, it is an airfoil, right? And we learn from an airfoil the pressure on the upper surface, we call it suction, is low, lower pressure. So the faster it spins, the pressure keeps dropping, and it drops below 1.6 psi. What will happen on the surface of that propeller? Cavitation. Cavitation. Boiling is usually when you add heat. Cavitation is where you make things, make water boil by reducing the pressure. <coughs> so if you spin the propeller too fast underwater, you have cavitation. So what? Invisible flow? Invisible flow? No. You're in submarine warfare. It makes noise. It makes noise. You tell the bad guy, hey, I'm here, shoot the torpedo at me. <laughs> right? All those cavity form and they collapse make huge noise. So that's application of engineering. Right? So you want to design a propeller that you can spin fast but avoid cavitation. That's a sidetrack, but back to this problem, do you understand the physics? Have you all done it? Any question on how the problem should be solved? First of all, maybe I should answer that first. You actually have two unknown. One is the height. The other unknown is what is the velocity through this device? At any station you name, because you know one station, you know every station by continuity, right? Okay? So the point is to solve this problem, you have to apply continuity twice, not just once. And where you pick the end point and start point is up to you. But until then, you don't have enough equation to solve the problem. Have you done it that way, I assume? And Bernoulli tries plus the continuity will get you the velocity inside the pipe and the height h. Any questions? Do I have to go through that for you? Open jet, so anything from here to here, pressure is always atmospheric. Can you do this problem if I give that in the test? I can tell you this is a pressurized vessel. Can you do it? I hope so. So instead of atmospheric pressure, it will be a gauge pressure. And versus the homework you have done, the forward velocity has to be higher or lower. Think about the physics. I'm now having pressure pushing the flow more than just gravity. So the velocity inside this pipe will be higher. equal to, yes, higher. Yeah, thank you. That's physics. It has to be higher, right? And, but it's the same, same problem. Right? Can you do it? So the last part is qualitative. It's not easy for me to explain in class, but think about you keep shrinking, shrinking this diameter. What will happen? Think of the extreme. That's easy for you to visualize. And the counter example is what if this has no neck, no neck. And that will tell you how you should change this diameter to avoid, avoid cavitation. And same, same with this pipe. Think about visualize yourself, how if I make this hole very small, or this X is the same as the other length, how would that change the dynamic of the problem? And that will help you to answer those qualitative questions. Questions on the old homework? I hope you take full advantage of the poster solution, because if you don't, I, I can't help you, and I can't force you to read them. It's all up to you. Okay. So with only five minutes left, I don't want to start the water jet problem. I will hold that and hold on that to future lecture. But instead, I want to just start very clearly of chapter eight. At least 
by way of a very brief introduction. So if you look at the world map that I draw you way back a couple of lectures ago, <coughs> We divide the whole semester into two subtopics. The first set of that is how we analyze a fluid problem and we talk about control volume. This is a nozzle of which I'm trying to determine the forces. And we also have what we call differential analysis of the Euler's equation as a very, very small tip of the iceberg in a very simple form, invisible, streamlined. And we're now done with experimentation, which is dimensional analysis. This is what? You are paid to do as an engineer. Of course, you're not going to solve Homer problem, right, at Siemens or Boeing. But the concept, the foundation, are all the same. If you don't satisfy continuity, I have a graduate student who won computer simulation without thinking about the physics, and it's what? Garbage in, garbage out. Right? <coughs> So all this is a tool that you need to do good engineering analysis. Right. So we are pretty much done with it, but we'll come back for the remaining second half of the semester to look at more in-depth differential analysis. The other world map is we separate the flow into different categories, <coughs> starting with the simplest for most of the entire semester incompressible. And then in visit. We are done with those. They are simple, but they are not physical. No fluid in the world is invisible. You always have to account viscosity. So why do you use Bernoulli? Well, I can get to the answer within 10% accuracy. And for most problems, that may be enough but not all. So we are now tackling the other end of the problem that what make people pay you a decent salary on. So we've done with invisit and now we are moving forward to, for the rest of the semester, how to deal with viscous effects. How do I account for viscosity? And under what assumption, despite it's not realistic, I can pretend the flow to be frictionless. And with the viscous flow, <coughs> it's further subdivided into external and internal. The internal meaning they're wall bounded. What does that mean? Example is the flow in the pipe. The pressure of the wall will influence the flow. An academic study, which we will do at the very end of the semester, flow between two parallel plates. Two plates up and down. And I'm blowing air in that channel. The air flow through this channel is bounded and influenced by the presence of the wall. And that has some first order effect on the flow behavior. The other category we call external, meaning it's unbounded. And there's several examples of that. We have already seen over a wing of an airplane. There's no adjacent wall except a takeoff near the ground, but air cutting through the airfoil at 10,000 feet has seen no effect of the wall. 
and no proximity of any war to influence the development flow. In academic, also one study instead of two pounds, say just one single play. And the flow going from left to right. I want to see how the flow developed on this plate. And it's not bounded by the wall on the other side. But the pressure of the wall will have an influence on how the fluid behaves. So we are right here. And this is a recap of your internal flow in the pipe in 21-24. So I'm just going to quickly go through that. We all know what the Reynolds number is. In this imaginary experiment, if I release dye, where the water flow in this pipe is very, very low speed, meaning the Reynolds number is less than 2,000, what happened to that dye filament? No good. How about I leave you at this? We went out of time, but do reveal your 21, 24. Next time I will quickly recap all of this in the background. <laughs>